This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is the number one mentoring program that teaches you e-commerce from scratch. Change has a real community with real results. I have been working with Ryan for many years now and have attended many of his events and retreats across the world and got to meet members and the amazing community of like-minded people. Ryan works with a lot of big names in the business world, helping them build online businesses and e-commerce. Change offers personal one-on-one support, no experience needed, but like anything, this takes time and is not a get-rich-quick scheme. If you put the work in, you will get the results. E-commerce and online shopping is getting bigger and bigger. This is a great opportunity for anyone that is looking for financial freedom. For more information, go follow Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help you get started and build a successful online business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got the gorgeous Jennifer Ellison. How are you? I'm good, I'm good, yeah. Good I'm ne- to see you. I'm nervous, I'm not going to lie. Why? I've never done a podcast before, ever. Why not? I don't know, been waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, massive name in 98 you were on Brookside. Yeah. Was it Emily? Yeah. Like massive, put you straight into the stratosphere of obviously the fame side of things. Mm-hmm. At that time when you were famous, you were famous. Now everybody can be famous, but you've done many things after. Obviously, you've got your dance school, acting, singing, SES, <laughs> um, Hell's Kitchen, which you won, Gordon Ramsay, Good Scotsman. Yeah. Yeah, you've done loads, babe, but it's good to see you. And you're looking well. You look as if you've lost a lot of weight. You're looking good. I've been trying. <laughs> is it? I needed to, so. <laughs> but it's like, it's harder as you get older, isn't it? Yeah, life, man. It fucking Hello. gets in the way, doesn't it? And the- business and it just comes at the bottom of your priorities so yeah. i had to just make a little bit of time for myself good on you before we get into everything though i always like to go back to the start of my guests get a bit of more of an understanding about you jennifer mm-hmm. where you grew up and how it all began so i grew up in liverpool um my mum and dad were just normal mum and dad um my mum was an administrator my dad worked in a, in a shop um and we didn't have a lot and they both worked the backsides off to 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 give me what they could. Um, my mum always wanted me to be a horse rider because she was obsessed with horses when she grew up. But every time the horse would go and eat grass, I'd fall off and end up in hospital more times. And then one day I was just watching Annie and um, I just started dancing around the living room and my grandma was like, take her to dancing. Um, and I think I was about seven at the time and then that was where everything changed yeah so you know do you think feel as if that was a passion then straight away that it's all you wanted to do from the first class that i ever did the teacher came out and was like to me mom she's got loads of potential and i think what was going to be like a little hobby quickly i think the teachers saw like potential in me and that i, I could go places and pretty pretty soon it got pretty serious um and then by the age of nine, I was a world international champion at jazz and ballet. So it, it kind of escalated quite quickly. How were you at school? Um, I always wanted to please people. I've always been like that from like when I've been a little girl. So I was never very intellectual naturally, but I always worked really hard. Um, I always wanted to please my mum. I wanted to please my teacher. I've always, always been like that. Little, yeah, I'm the same. I think people pleasing, but that can be draining as well. Yeah. Because sometimes you try and please the wrong people as well, and it's just you just want everybody to like you. Definitely. How was the parents? Um, brilliant. I couldn't have asked for a better childhood. Um, did absolutely everything they could. Um, and my little sister, bless her, she just kind of followed drama country because 
one weekend I was in London, the next weekend I was in Birmingham. We were just all over the country um, competing in like the World Championships, the English Championships. It was just, it just took over our family basically. How was that constant, being constantly on the go? Did you not realise it then? Because you're naive to it, you're just kind of happy you're doing it. But Yeah, it was just my passion and my love and I just loved it. But I don't actually realise until now the sacrifice that my family actually made um, because when I'm doing it now with my son with football I'm like every weekend thinking god you've got to go back and got to go there for 40 there for 40 there for 40 there for rugby but it was it it never was an issue for me mom and dad yeah. that's the thing the sacrifice that parents have to go through to then it's the money mm. it's the constant money it's never ending yeah. um, dresses shoes ballet shoes whatever it is and then on the travels Everything that comes with it, can you appreciate it more, what they actually put in? Oh, God, yeah. But my mum never, ever, ever let me know, like, the struggle that she's going through. Like, it was only recently that she told me that she pawned the rings to get me tap shoes. And I was like, mum? And, like, that was never, ever known. I Like, I never, ever knew. All I knew was that we were living in a lovely home and I, and I was going to dancing and I could go to this competition. That competition had the best tutus, had the best of everything. But like, it's only as you become old that you realise what your parents actually do. How ruthless was that industry? Because now it's still ruthless, but back then it seemed more cut through it. Oh, it was ruthless. Parents fighting and... Yeah, like I'd walk in and... Don't forget, I was probably about 10, 11, and the parents would just go, oh, well, we might as well go home if she's here. And I was like, I was a child. Um, but because I was so good, I I don't know, it was just... I, but it was it was crazy because I got into the Royal Ballet School so we were competing at the All England and I was competing against a, a young girl whose mum and dad owned and Bessie Yorkshire Puddins and she arrived at Sadler's Wells in a helicopter on on the roof and me and my mum had hired a Renault Megane to, to, to drive to London <laughs> and it broke down and it, like it was like getting into the competition and you know, she's got, like, the best physio looking after and everything, and I'm just Jen from Liverpool who rocks up, and I won. Like, so it was kind of... She's gone on to be a prima for the... a prima ballerina for the Royal Ballet, and she always says, I, I always remember Jen. Um, and it's just... It was crazy, like, two different worlds, but talent. You can't buy talent, can you? And yeah. It's, um, it's something that I had when I was little that was, especially for dance, yeah, that was kind of... Spoke for itself. Yeah, because the ballet industry, you kind of see that as kind of the upper class, the kind of people who's got money, the people who get to the front, the people who get the additions. Yeah. And uh, the kids from fucking Glasgow, Liverpool, we kind of don't really get pushed to the front. But like you say, talent shines through no matter how much money you've got. No. How ruthless, how tough is ballet? Ballet is, it, it's very ruthless because I think ballet, like people go, how did you handle Gordon Ramsay? Like, when everyone was cracking up around you, I was like, it was nothing compared to like some of the ballet mistresses that we used to have. They were terrifying. Um, and it gave you this massive discipline from a very, very young age where you had to be on time, you had to listen. Um, you know, it was it was a training and it was an intense training. And I was dancing every single day um, from after school till sometimes 10 o'clock at night, all day Saturday, all day Sunday. And it was a lifestyle for me but it was a conditioning and it was like preparing me for what went on to be in my career. Mm -hmm. So 14, you joined Brookside 15, what age? I was, I just had my 13th birthday, I think. Yeah. So you were doing everything from dancing, singing, acting. What was the one thing that you wanted to do? I never, ever wanted to, I always just wanted to be famous, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I know that sounds really, oh, and I hate saying it, but, I remember sitting on a chip shop counter and I was doing my dancing and I had my da dancing tracksuit on and a lady walked in and she was like, oh, hello. She went, what's your name? And unbeknownst to me, she was an agent. So um, she had she had loads of people from Brookside and I'm just sitting there swinging my legs on the on the, the counter and she starts talking to me. Um, and then the next day, my dance teacher got a phone call and she was like, I, I was talking to a young girl, she was from Liverpool because my dance school was in St. Helens. And she went, oh, no, it'll be, it'll be Jennifer. And she was like, I'd really like to represent her. So 
that was how I ended up getting an agent. It wasn't through me going to acting school or training or going to drama class. And then she just put me up for two auditions. The first was a personal advert. The second was for a Happy Meal with the toy for McDonald's. And the third was Brookside. And that's it. And that was it. How was that then, getting the part? Was it, Did you audition for a certain part or was it just a case of auditioning and then you get put into it? They were auditioning for a massive new family that were going in. Um, and I was supposed to be a swimmer. And my mum, a typical dance mum, she was like, have me in the swimming pool every night. I couldn't swim. I was like, Ugh! anyway, I came out like an Olympic athlete when I finished. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I learned to, to, to properly swim. And then we went into the audition. We started getting recalled and recalled and recalled. And then it came down. I think I went in about 10 times. They started pairing us up then with like a mum, a dad, a sister, a brother. Um, and then it got down to like the last, I think it was about three families. And that was when it got real. And I'd always lived around the corner from where it was filmed. And it was like, people say, you can manifest things. And I always knew I'd be in it. It's weird. Like, I always visualised myself being in Brookside. And years before, I'd gone into my dance school and told everyone that I'd had an audition for, for Brookside and I was going to pay Tinhead's girlfriend. And I hadn't. And I ended up being Tinhead's wife in the, in the show, which is really because people say about the secrets and if you if you like visualize things, it can happen. And that definitely did happen with me with Brookside. Um, and I got the job, and my whole life changed. And when I got my first paycheck, my mum was like, "They're paying you for this." Like she couldn't understand that I was getting paid to be in it because everything that was ever done. She'd had to pay loads of money for it and she actually couldn't believe that I was getting paid to be in Brookside as a child. Um, and then that was just the start of it then. Because it was massive Brookside, wasn't it? It was Don't mega. Don't forget, there was only four channels. Yeah, one, two, three and four. Like, if you say that to kids now, like, they just can't comprehend it. Like, what was Brookside? Channel four? Channel four, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Fuck me, man. Like, because you're talking 15, 20 million people back then. Mm -hmm. Like I said earlier, when you're a celebrity, you were a celebrity then, and you became the pin up girl. Mm -hmm. Did you feel pressure or was it enjoyment at the start? And then it turns to pressure. It was enjoyment. Like, I was just, I did my first men's mag through Mercy TV at 16. And it was like a GQ front cover, um, like a Lolita, and I had like a, a cowboy hat on. And I should never have been allowed to do it, really, looking back. Like, if, what I look at now is is my college and the safeguarding policies and procedures and everything that we have to do to safeguard young people. I should never have been allowed to do that, really. Um, but then it was such a success that I was just getting bombarded with them. Like one day, I remember walking into Sainsbury's and I was on the front of every single magazine, a men's magazine, and front of the newspapers. And I was just like... Yeah, that's nonsense. I know. <laughs> I'm laughing, but then, now I think more people are aware of it. Mm. More people are understanding. Still a lot of weird stuff goes on. Um, but 16, my daughter's 14. I don't let her have sleepovers. I don't let her no. do nothing. Like my, I'm a overprotector maybe, but I don't care. I can sleep better at night. And exactly. Was a nobody to say nah that's not right or was it a case of you're flying high in life it was the, th the thing to do I think my mum just didn't want me missing out on opportunities she didn't want to rock the boat with Brookside and then Brookside was just having this exposure that they'd never ever had before and it was just I think it was just I don't know it just was allowed to happen yeah because you're only a kid 15, 16 mm -hmm. and still very young but again, you're naive to that industry where you can be manipulated to then feel as if other things are normalised when they shouldn't really be. No. Do you feel used back then from that age? Or were you just happy to have the opportunities? I was just loving my life, I'm not going to lie. Mm. I, now, being a mum and being a principal of a school, I feel like I was used a little bit. And not protected for my acting career because... I was a good actress, you know what I mean? And I, I I feel like that got overshadowed by the modelling side. And if I would have had someone like behind me saying, no, Jen, you need to to stay. Like I look at like 
people now in the industry and it's very, they don't cross over, whereas mm. they crossed over a lot when I was young. But Do you think people can lose the respect for your acting if you're on all the men's magazines? I feel like at the time it was different then and everybody was doing it, all the soap girls were doing it. Um, but... This episode is sponsored by Fire Away Pizza, the fastest growing pizza company in the UK with over 150 stores. With their fresh quality ingredients and unique pizzas, they will have you coming back for more. Use code JAMES20 for 20% off. That's JAMES20 for 20% off. I feel like after it, when I got into Phantom... And I went to LA and everything for, I feel like it was frowned upon. Um, and I remember an agent, a really an amazing agent who was like putting me up for bonds and things like that. He said, we need to get you to dye your hair brown. You need to completely lose all this image and you need to not be, you know, go doing these magazines. What should we get for magazines back then though? You're not getting like 10, 20, 50 K back then. I was, magazines were magazines then, and one day I did a certain magazine, and because I was, I won the best front cover um, for G, for FHM, and then I was voted the world's sexiest blonde for FHM, so they couldn't get enough of me, so one day I got paid, I think, I got paid like 50,000 for a, a front cover and a shoot, but they wanted to do two in one day, so I got 100 grand. Yeah, that's the sad reality. Day. Yeah, but the thing is, we know it's wrong because, but and money sells, money talks, money takes us to places that we shouldn't go. But we just crave it so much. Like you say, it's fame, it's money, it's mm. so a sex, it's an attraction. It's not till you're in your thirties, forties that you think I was chasing the wrong fucking thing. I am. Because having a talent's an amazing thing to have, and your talent or your craft, whatever you do, can take you so far in life. It can take you and open up so many doors. But we tend to sell ourselves. I'm just lucky enough to be doing this in my mid-30s where I started this in my mid-30s to understand I'm not going to sell out. And I've been speaking about it. I rejected six figures for like alcohol brands and um, gambling. In my 20s, if I was on my, bang on the coke then in the booze, I would have took it no problem. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I did turn down Playboy um, for like nearly half a million because I just thought if I ever have little boys and I'm so glad it down because like my three little lads I don't think the internet's like crazy now because even like when they're playing rugby they'll go oh your ma your ma's fit or this or that like and because they've seen me in like the men's mags and not now but like I think they've all had a little google um so if there would have been anything like that out now I'd have been mortified so <laughs> I am glad that I did Fair that. Play. That's respectable, that because I see the women now, and no disrespect to Katie Price and stuff like that, but you can see the damage it eventually takes on the soul with they're constantly getting used and willing to accept it because they're making money from it. But back in the day, like I says, when you were on those magazines, you were known everywhere, and it must be hard. To then reject it, but you've, by the grace of God, you've been raised right to then go. Wait a minute, I have boundaries because that's too much money mm. to reject. But you see the damage it does with the people who've done Playboy, who end up doing OnlyFans and doing all the other stuff. They're so far gone. Yeah. I feel as if they're so lost, and it's sad because there was a kid who committed suicide not so long ago because there was a file getting sent about with his mum's OnlyFans <sighs> and his school. So you've been blessed. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Your own Nuts magazine, all the other. Nobody's really asked. You never no. went full steam ahead, but that's the effects it has. And I think I feel as if women now and listen. I've got friends and only do only fans, male and female. I've no dis, dis, I've never disrespect or I've never mm -hmm. shit on them because it's their choices. But they think in their mind they're doing the right thing for their kids because they can get nice clothes, nice whatever it is. But it's the effects that happens when they're teenagers because money can't oh, ever fix that. So it's difficult and I can't judge everybody because I interview enough people now to realise a lot of them are broken souls and they think they're doing the right thing. Genuinely, they mm. think they're doing the right thing. But it's not till later on they realise they were chasing the wrong thing. Mm, definitely. What age did you get offered Playboy? I just filmed Phantom, so 21. Um, and I went over to LA and I actually sat in the Playboy office. Um, 
and it was like surreal. And she said I didn't have to do full nude, I just had to be in my bum and boobs. But was it I, your my dad was a hackney taxi driver and <laughs> I thought he was going to get, he can't go, go and work on the rank. And I just thought, if I ever have little boys, that's there forever. And I know it's classy and people like Demi Moore and all that have done it, but I just thought once you've once you've done that, then there's no going back, is there? You lose yourself completely because then there's nothing off, but there's no boundaries. No. Twenty one half a million back then. That's a few million now. Do you know what I mean? I so fair play was it Hugh Hefner? Hugh Hefner was there. He was still like obviously still alive and everything, but it was it's a lead who looks after who does all the contracts. Who I met, and it was mad because. I actually left saying I'll think about it. And I don't know, it just wasn't, it wasn't really, it's not something that I ever like seriously considered because of my dad, because of having little boys, the thoughts of having little boys. But your dad's raised you right then. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You've obviously have some, you've got respect for your father. Mm -hmm. And that's more, more than it's weight in gold because a lot of people don't respect their dads, respect no. what the other people say. So you've had it in them because you could, even though you craved the fame, you still understood the effects it could have on other people. And that's, for me, that's a great gift to have anybody to feel what other people, how they would react. If mm -hmm. My dad was a black cack as well and he spoke to everyone. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. People can be ruthless as well. And sometimes they like to brag. So when I played football, my dad would say, oh, my son's playing for us. I could see the excitement. But if he's saying, oh, my son's Jenna, proud of you. Yeah. And the guy go, oh, I've fucking seen her tits on oh, Playboy. Oh, I did feel like that was it. Yeah. Yeah. You just thought, poor dad. <laughs> I didn't do that too. Yeah. So at the height of Brookside, how was the fame when you were hitting, like, 17, 18? How was your popularity then? I actually, after Brookside, I recorded my album and then straight away I got there was like the craziest two years I finished Brookside recorded an album um, got Phantom film Phantom won Hell's Kitchen and then went straight into playing a leading lady in the West End Chicago the youngest ever Roxy that all happened between 20 and 21 why did they kill you off in Brookside? Could the, was Brookside ended then? I, I can't remember the year it ended, but was that a, was that a plan? Or there was a massive deal about to get signed, which I knew nothing about, and it was for a spin-off show with Tin Head and Emily. Um, and I didn't know anything about it, so my agents had been sorting out other things. And then when I went to tell them I was leaving, they were like, we've got this spin-off show for you. And I was like, we'd already, like, committed to other other projects and I always wanted to sing and perform um, so then they were like we'll leave the door open for you so I fell out the window when I was in a coma so I was in this coma for six for six months and every now and again I'd turn the telly on and see Tina crying by my bed <laughs> I was just this one shot <laughs> and then one day I think they just got a bit pissed off at me and I turned the telly on and it was my funeral and I was like oh I'm dead did they not give you a heads up no do you still get paid if they use your the coma think, footage? Yeah. Because <laughs> that, that's what it seemed like through bitterness or anger. They seemed pissed off at you. Yeah. Because you were the biggest character on it. No disrespect to anybody else. One of the biggest, but mm. is uh, to kill you off, then it's been bitterness. They've been pissed off because they'll probably feel as if they made you. But yeah. your talent spoke for itself. You could have done anything. See, when, you're, so when you get killed off, what was the plan? Did you believe in yourself that other things would happen? Because a lot of people leave these big shows and can never kick on because it's all they kind of know. Because you be coming on that, when you interview people who's been in the soaps now and they struggle to find a different character because they're just yeah. basically Pigeon known holes. for that character. Yeah. Did you have the belief to then go, wait a minute, I've got something more to then be something else? I did, yeah. I, it never kind of crossed my mind that I'd be out of work or anything and then it just snowballed it was crazy like the opportunities that came and it was like everything that I'd ever dreamed of happened in a year like I'd grown up like dreaming to play Roxy Hart as a little kid Ruthie Henshaw actually she actually presented me with me when I won the Janet Cram with me awards and she was just opening in Chicago and I was like looking at her just fascinated with this woman just thinking I want to be like you I want to do I want to play that role so that was like a, it was like a dream from when I was a little girl and to actually get that at such a young age 
The only thing that I'll tell you right now is it was wasted on me because I didn't appreciate it at the time. Like now I look back and I go, wow, what you've achieved, the places you've been, the people you've worked with. Like there's people on the telly in like Hollywood movies or like massive, massive American series, dramas, and I'll go to the kids. Your mum's worked with them. And they go, what have you won? I'm like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, it, so it's like, I never lived in the moment. I was always, what's next? Being an actress, being self-employed, you're always thinking, what's next, what's next? So you never actually, I never enjoyed the now. I was never present. Mm -hmm. I was always thinking of, what am I going to do next? What, am I gonna, what happens when this ends? Yeah, but that's always... It's always the same. We, we kind of get older and a bit wiser to then look at that. But when you're young, you're just you're just going through the motions. Mm -hmm. Everything's going so fast. That's a fast-paced world you were in. How was it in like Chicago and Phantom and Opera? How difficult is that from being a, an actress, kind of on screen? It's kind of listen. It's long hours, and but you're just reading a few lines here and there to then being on stage to then you can't really fuck up. Everything's live, singing, mm -hmm. dancing, acting like. Is it a big difference or can you separate the two? I've always grown up performing, so that was what I love to do. But with Chicago, I think my first few days were just absolutely terrifying. Um, but with Phantom, it was a Hollywood movie that was filmed over like a year. So we were in Pinewood Studios filming it and it just like... Like it was Andrew Lloyd Webber, Gerard Butler, Mini Driver, Oscar nominated actors and actresses working with them every day and I was just like living my dream basically and but didn't actually there was that much shit going on like behind closed doors that I don't think I ever really fully appreciated it and I just wish I could go back and relive it and appreciate it what shot? just so much <laughs> shit. Um, I was massively, massively successful. And as you say, like, there was no Instagram, there was no influencers. It was like fame when fame was fame. And I'm working with Hollywood A-listers. I'm in London in a hotel, staying in a hotel. And I... Like, back home in Liverpool on the news, my house has been shot at with an AK-47, like, and I'm having to go into work with all these, Andrew Lloyd Webber, Gerard Butler, who directed Batman, Phone Booth, he was my director, and it was just like, it was so embarrassing, and, oh, I don't know, it's just like, like, they, like, there was concerns because of what had happened at home. There was concerns and some of the cast and some of the people didn't want me to continue filming. They wanted to, me to be, like, almost sacked. Um, but the director, Gerard Butler, just loved me and fought for me and was like, she's going nowhere. Did you feel that extra pressure? Because you know some of these people were thinking shouting for their own safety their own safety is in jeopardy but there would have been a lot of jealousy because of who you were as well like you say that fame that talent plus you were gorgeous so there would have been so much envy there as well and that's very cutthroat business nobody really has your back in that industry and did you feel as if your world was crashing down as if you were to blame because yeah. everything you'd done I felt like I felt like my dad was, my dad, as I said, he's a taxi driver. He was looking after my house. And he comes in at three, it happened like three o'clock in the morning. That's when he's coming in from work sometimes. And if he's had just been like, the the bullets had gone through the front door, through the kitchen door, through the back window and ended up in the back neighbour's roof. So like if he's had been start, stood making a sandwich or cooking something he's been dead so like I had that to deal with as well like I, I was fearful for my family like I was thinking god what situation have I put put them in did you feel your life was in danger or were there... certain times god yeah yeah massively do you know that fear that you get when you watch a horror movie I think I spent about two years of my life with that constantly anxiety but we're still... fear fear 
but it never goes. We kind of get over it. You think, okay, push through, but you go through some sort of trauma, especially being an innocent girl who just try to do right in life, being naive to certain things maybe, because men are very manipulative. We talk a good game. We talk push, but as well. And uh, it's difficult. What age were you then when this all happened? I was like... 17 when I got with Tony and then it was he was just involved in something that I didn't even could comprehend um just gangland in, in Liverpool um which I had nothing to do with nothing at all to do with but they didn't see it like that and because I was on tv so famous I was a target like these are horrible people who just like, don't care, like, literally have just walked into pubs and macheted people up and, like, they just didn't care, but I had nothing to do with it. The media would have had a field day. Did you feel the extra pressures and stresses? Did you feel your whole life was shattering down and your career was ending? Yeah, I think... I just think I was so, like... I don't know, I was worried for him, I was worried for my family. I felt like my career was like the escapism from it because it kept me away from Liverpool. It almost kept us safe. Um, because like literally one day I drove out of my house and a well-known family in Liverpool are chasing me in the car and he's just like screaming to me when I say slam on. So he slammed on literally drove over a central embankment, like the car lifted off its feet. And the next thing, you know, you've got this machete, I'm driving, and he's got hold of his ankles. This sounds so mad when I'm saying it. To the, one of the lads have got hold of his ankles, and he's just battering my car with this machete, and it's just literally flying at me. And I'm, like, at the height of fame, like, massively, massively famous. And it's just two parallel worlds that were just... Yeah. It was... That's like a movie in itself. Honestly, like the th like, I don't. Know, I've got, I, I've definitely got PTSD because I can't. Like I blacked out. Any woman who's had who's given birth will hundred percent get this. Like you remember a little bit of it, but and you remember the worst bit, but then it's like you can't remember the whole thing. And my twenties are very much like that because what I went through, like normal people just don't go through it yeah you go on autopilot yeah and then having to stand there in like a premiere or filming a scene and, and, and be normal when like your world's crashing apart and you're literally sellotaping your letterbox because you're worried of what's going to get put through your front door what sort of stuff are the media saying just went to town like it was on national like I was in London in the hotel in the Marius and just national news. Actress Jennifer Ellison's house has been, the police were everywhere because the police were tipping all the reporters off as well. Hmm. But you're still young. How long did that relationship last? Um, too long. <laughs> Seven years. But you s even just speaking to you for 10 minutes, you seem so loyal. You seem like the person who tries to help everybody, even though it's destroying yourself. And that's where sometimes loyalty can get you hurt. I actually think I was scared of what would happen to him. Mm. And like he, the things he's done to me, like just, he had no, loyal, no loyalty to me. And then in the end, I was always terrified to leave, but he got caught cheating on the front of the News of the World. So it was like my get out of jail card, like it literally like meant that I wasn't going to get my face slashed, like he always used to say. And, it was just like I could go without there being any repercussions. Because you had an excuse, even though you had mm -hmm. fucking thousands of excuses. Yeah. Like, How hard has that been in an abusive relationship, especially being a Hollywood actress, especially being the height of your fame and popularity to then be pretending all the time? Oh, two different bad. characters. I was an actress on telly, but then I was an actress to like my mum and my family, like one day we all went like a group of us and whenever like we'd be in a group he got oh, dead paranoid like, he always think thought I was like after his mate or whatever and it was like further from the truth and we went out to Attica nightclub 
and he started being dead funny all day. And um, anyway, he starts drinking and whatever, all the other and went up having this. And I was no angel. We had this argument in the middle of a nightclub. And as I went, turned away, I went like that with my drink. And he just went like that, bang, on the back of my head with a Budweiser bottle. Like, literally, and my head just, I went like that with my hands. And it was just like blood, but like clots of blood, blood like. So they put a, a, a I always never ever forget it. They put like a, a blanket over me head and got me into the into the ambulance, but there was photographers everywhere. So we had blood running down my legs. And um it was all over the newspapers on the news and everything. Got to the hospital and the hospital was like, Your extensions have saved your life. You were like literally that far away from like your jugular vein. And they've hit your extensions and gone it's gone up. And they said you just you to just bled out anyway, ends up having to have like ten staples in my head. And, I, like, I remember my mum going, what's happened, what's happened, what's he doing, what's he doing? Because it was on the newspaper the next day. I'm in this hotel in London. I was like, nothing, mum. Your hands are covered in blood. You've cut your wrist. You've cut something. You've cut yourself. I was like, by no mum. I was like, mum, look. And I had a big gash in the back of my head with ten staples. Mum, nothing. It was the press. And I was like, lying to me, mum. Lying to me family. I'll never forget when I broke my collarbone and I went in, went into Whiston the hospital and the doctor just looked at me like that and as my mum left the room he went we have rugby players he went you have bad he went and they can't break that bone like he went it's one of the hardest bones in your body to break he went how have you done it because i just said oh, well fell over how is that when it's everything's a lie becomes a lie then you, you forget actually who you are the innocent young girl to try and make something of her life to then being terrorized possibly killed Lying to your mum and dad who you love the most, who I can I, I can see that you love the most. It must have fucking mentally, physically, emotionally just broke you. Yeah, I was. I was like, I was a mess then. Like, a mess. Like, and... I was trying to protect everyone. And then the more... Like, I thought, oh God, I shouldn't be with him. The more it, like, made me protect him. Is that trauma bonding? What is that? Stockholm Syndrome kind of come back because you feel as if you love someone you know it's wrong you feel empty but then you miss them it's it's a whirlwind of emotions and I felt sorry for them as well like I, I felt really like like sorry for him like like if I, if I leave him he's got nothing like and what well, he's going to get attacked or he's going to end up in jail which he did uh, yeah it's a messy situation and that kind of mm. especially the heights of it but could have people pr tried to protect you more with the circle that was coming into your life? Or was it just a case of you were own, your own woman then and you had too much status to then make people your own decisions? People tell me what to do and the more my mum, like I remember my mum turning up and going, you're coming home with me and I was like, mum! And it almost made me fight with my mum and like protect him even more. Why do you think you loved him so much? I didn't love him at the time. Now I look back, I, that wasn't love. It really wasn't love. It was... I don't know, like, it was this weird, like, I, felt I was just in too deep, like, and just couldn't see a way out and was basically trying my best to stay afloat and to protect everything and doing absolutely terribly at it. Were you ever suicidal? Probably, yeah. Like, I think there was times when... I just thought, like, I couldn't cope anymore. Like, I don't think you can... You realise how terrified I was. Like, I, I didn't come into Liverpool City Centre for about five years of my life. Didn't walk down the high street, like... And then when I got... When I finished with them, I was, like, walking down the high street, like, shopping of a day, like... Oh, my God. Because I didn't feel like I was going to be machetes or shot or... I know it sounds really dramatic, but... Like, it was just crazy what I went through. Yeah, it's a crazy, that's a crazy, crazy life, but I do understand it as well to know that people are too scared to leave because you're also scared for the person who's made that life happen. You don't want anything to happen to them because if you're a, a good person, you're scared to leave them because anything does happen, you blame yourself. 
but then again, you don't really look after yourself. So it's, you're never really winning because if you leave, you're still worrying. If you stay there, you're still worrying. So it's a difficult situation to be in. And a lot of, listen, a lot of girls could, will relate to this mm -hmm. as well. A lot of people go through mental torture, mental abuse, physical abuse, um, and they can't leave because they're just so caught up with being programmed for five, ten years, told that they're not good enough. You'll never find anybody else. You can't leave me. They're just living in fear. I was you, terrified for my family as well. Like, he's always say, like, I want to, like, do stuff to your mum and stuff like that. If, like, and then he'd have a Z, a Z down your face if you, I ever left. And, like, I was I was scared for that. Like, I thought, and it's, like, his mates, his family, I just thought they got, they'll go and get me mum or they'll do something to my mum's house or... Did anything ever happen to your mum or that's house? No. But... I honestly believe if I'd left him, then it would have. Like, if it would have been me who was pictured with someone else or me who... So I basically just had to live my life until, thank God, the news of the world were on him. And they literally followed him for three days, sat outside the hotel room, had recordings of him, and it was black and white. Who was he cheating with? A girl called Shalimar Wimble. What name? <laughs> what a fucking name. We've been with like John Terry and I just one of those ones. She used to come out to them the United Club and like show a thong and stuff. Yeah, one of those ones. Mm -hmm. Um but she's No offence to Shelly. Yeah, of course, but Everyone. she's been your saving grace. She's my like hero. Like yeah. literally. How do you get help and come over that? How do you get over that? Because your career did hit us it kinda of hit a standstill, didn't it? Mm -hmm. Was that because of everything that you went through? All the PTSD, all the worries. Because PTSD wasn't really spoken about. Mental health wasn't spoken about then. No. What are you talking, 15 years ago? Over 15 years ago? I literally just had to take time. Um, and I just didn't know who I was. I had to do a lot of building of myself back up because I was this mess, like, mess and, like, terrified and... Didn't know who I was, didn't know what I wanted to do, and I had to rebuild myself and like take time for that. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't know if I wanted to do any of it anymore. Not made sense. How do you go from being the confident, strong, independent from a very young age to an abusive relationship? When did it kind of take its toll? When did was there telltale signs? from it was it straight away or was it like six months a year usually people can put the mask on for three months six months you think life is amazing then the mask slips but you're too ready you're already too invested because then you give people chance after chance after chance like when did it sink in okay this ain't normal i think it was when we actually we did split up like i think it still affects me now like like, I really do think it still affects me now. Like, people can't un understand, like, why I'm so underconfident. And even, like, auditions, now I get an audition through and I'd rather, like, literally stab myself in the eyeball and go for it. I'm so... I've, I used to be so confident. Like, I could walk into any room, sing for you, dance for you, do whatever you wanted. And, like, now I'm just like... I can't, I can't, I can't. I, I really do think it's from that. Because I just stopped going into audition rooms completely, stopped wanting to be put up for anything, didn't answer the phone to me agent. Like, so then getting back into it was almost too traumatic. Plus, when you've lost your confidence. Yeah, it's always going to affect you. Mm. Always going to affect you. And it's, but you learn to deal with it and it will make you stronger. I believe this podcast will kick you on. I believe you understand how great you are and the talent you have got to do something special. You've done many special things. This is just part of your story. Mm -hmm. As crazy as it is, it's still a fucking beautiful story. It's still <laughs> fucking madness because have you ever read a book? No. Nothing. So this is what I'm saying. This is the opportunities that arise. You could fucking make a show about it, your life. Why not make money these, from it? Like, I love, I want to do a really gritty like northern drama mm -hmm. and my husband's like Jen you've got everything there to write it yourself yeah. like Saran Jones has written loads and he's like why don't you write like because I love Bands of Girls do you ever remember Bands yeah, of yeah, Girls yeah. like something like that and he's like just write it yourself you've got enough experiences that's all it is know, that's all it is yeah, listen you're fucking doing a podcast you've got plenty of bottle 
plenty bottle, you've came this far, you're still here, babe, you're a fucking mother. Like I say, this is why these long formats are important, because people get a better understanding and the support that you'll get. And then it's a case of you kicking on, because we can't keep living in the past. No. It just drains us. It's constantly sad. My mum's lost two brothers to murder. I've fucking lost many people, madness. And you do think about it, because there's certain times you wish, how far could I have went if I never went through all the trauma and pain that I would? But then I wouldn't be able to connect to people at a deeper level as well. So we can we can... It makes, it comes, it swings in both ways, life, good, mm. bad, fucking whatever it is. And you've came through that much, make make money from your pain. Make get success from it and fucking, and laugh about it because it's fucking torture. It's, that is psychotic behaviour. And you've got to laugh and think, how fucking naive was I to be accepting AK-47s and oh, chase with yeah. machetes? Because in that life, because Liverpool's tough. I always say I fucking love the Scousers. There's something about the Scousers I can relate with the Glaswegians. Yeah, we're kind of, we're, we're not right in the head. <laughs> we're, we're, we're not, we're tapped. Like I say, the, the misery and pain my family's been through. And listen, my family and friends have caused a lot of misery as well. So it's not a case of I'm the victim. But it's the same kind of connections. We're all fucking wired wrong. We kind of, <laughs> we kind of just get through life and we seem to work better in chaos. When my life's sense. gone too good, I think that ain't normal. If I've got chaos, it makes me work harder because I try and overcome it. So we're never victims. Scousers, Glaswegians will never be victims. But we are tapped on a whole different level. We're yeah. not right. We're not mentally... We're, I don't know if they fucking poison the water down here <laughs> or up there. But there's something missing. But we've also got hearts of gold. We've also got fucking loyalty and love as well. Mm -hmm. And it's sad, but even his life as well, how fucked up he must be to be normalising that life because I have friends the exact same whose girlfriend's cars have been blew up their shops have been blew up and all that and it, it's kind of normalised but it's schoolboy stuff mm -hmm. you shouldn't be harming anybody's fucking girlfriend or kids or mums or dad but we're living in a generation where it's all fucking pussies and everybody talks like gangsters they ain't gangsters the gangsters don't be cutting about doing that schoolboy stuff but we we can glamorise that life as well because no matter who it is as well, Jen, you, that's a turn on for some weird reason. Mm. Like All the girls who I grew up with loved the bad boys. But before you know it, they're getting beat. Their fucking husbands are in prison. Their boyfriends are in prison. They become damaged because mm -hmm. they've got all this easy stuff. But it comes at a cost because they lose it all. But, and then they try and chase it again. Before you know it, they've kind of been round the, the fucking block and they become damaged. They've got kids to multiple men. And it's sad that we... We look into that life as a as a as a great life and a get out, but it's not. It's nothing but misery. You've mm. tasted it firsthand. Hundred percent. Did you? Feel, what was your friends in that scene? A lot of my friends became his friends' girlfriends. Actually, I am. Um, so it was just normalized. And it whole, was normalized. Could it yeah. talk to anybody? It made sense. No, and I do think at first, like he was always dead funny, the life and soul, and it was like that little bit of a. I've never like, I don't know, I don't know what I was thinking, but yeah, I must be a bit tapped. <laughs> Scouser Dave, these are all fucking loonies. That's why I love you, cunt. So you're fucking mad, but you are. It's the same as the traveller community. Days. days. Yeah. Like, but it's because of your love and affection also, though. It's because of your loyalty. You probably blamed yourself for some things. You probably yeah. concerned yourself of his well being. Everybody, you're trying to save everybody. And but, I wasn't an angel, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not going to sit here and say I was like, I had have a good go, do you know what I mean? And so, like, I do feel like, but is it, I was worried about what was happening after. I think that's what made me, and then actually leaving. How was it leaving? Were you still concerned? Obviously, you had that kind of past to go, okay, you cheated, but you had many times to go, but were you still concerned? Or did you feel it was, it was done, it's over, it's time to change? I pined for him, like, because I've been with him for seven years. Um, and he was like almost, as much as he was like, he was like a security blanket as well, because he was there, like, and he was the one person who I could talk to, and because I, I was lying to so many people. So he was actually probably the only person that I was ever normal and myself with because I was lying to my mum, I was lying to my best friends, I was lying. What was your dad saying? No one actually knew what had happened until afterwards and then I think they all just felt like the biggest, not the biggest fools, but why have I 
not done something by having a protected head, but I was lying yeah. to everyone. No one knew. We're great pretenders, and it's plus you're the actress as well, so you could lie your fucking way through anything. That's my concern of my daughter. I'm too overprotective, and I'm scared that she hides it so well because she knows the damage I'll do. And I ain't no gangster, but I know I would kill for her. Yeah. I would happily do 30 years in the jail for knowing I'm protecting my family. Of course. That's not to be tough. The same as your dad. Your dad would probably do more damage to him than he would do your dad if you know the damage it was doing to you. Yeah. Because that's a real father. That's mm -hmm. a real man. You know, so. That's how it's the heartbreaking thing because we don't want to be shooting and fucking stabbing and chasing people, but to protect the people they love, you we're the cunts who would do it. Yeah, and that's how fucking that's how deep and rooted love should be, and that's as men should provide and protect to that way. And listen, I've had toxic relationships, very toxic, but as a man's role, it's provide and protect. It's to and a woman's role for me is to nurture and love. But when there's totally opposites of full control. You can never go in your feminine because then you end up in your masculine because mm -hmm. you need to be tough for a life that should is not normal. No. Was there any backlash when you left, or was it a case of was it a clean clean cut leave? No, it was actually a clean cut leave because I think that he tried to tell me that he wasn't cheating, um, and that he was getting these girls into the news bar which was the place to go at the time um, he would he was just seeing them to get them into the news bar my mum was like one of them was Joanne Beckham and he was, she was like why does she need Tony to get it in the news bar like and I was like but mum and then my agent just spoke to the reporter and he just sent all the files over he went if she doesn't believe it there and I, there was like no denying it because being in that height and being who you were there all your relationships were in the papers was it difficult to have a steady relationship? Even though, listen, you gave the fucking papers ammunition mm -hmm. because that's madness. You know what I mean? That is madness, but no fault of your own. No, it's no, it's not, it's not your fault. It's no, nothing you could have done. You just done that relationship where it's yeah. kind of took you. That's the cards you've been dealt. But how hard is it to have a relationship in that kind of limelight back then? Hard. Yeah, really difficult. And like, people just don't, People think that they own you. Like, it's fine now because I'm not, like, the height I was then. Um, but at one time, I literally couldn't, like, go places, like, on a Saturday or, I, like, if it was bank holiday and there was, like, such, something on, like, the last thing I'd want to do is go because I'd just be stood there taking pictures all day. And some people don't have, like, respect. Like, when I very first went on holiday with my husband, he was sat having a meal with me and next thing you know, my chair gets pulled out. A baby gets sat on my knee and someone just puts an arm around and goes, smile, girl. And I'm, and he was just like, wow. And he struggled, like really struggled at first mm -hmm. to like understand it. But since I've had opened the school, like the kids, that's all calmed down and it's it's mm -hmm. absolutely fine now. What about the Stevie Gerrard thing? Can I talk about that? Yeah. Because yeah. that's, he's a massive name in Liverpool. You were a massive name. Yeah. How was that relationship? Um, That to be honest with you, we were both kids. Um, like, I was, what, 16? Um, and he'd only just, like, I was at the first game that he scored his first goal. He'd, like, literally just broke into the side. Um, and, like, he, he, he just catapulted and got all this attention from everywhere and was just a typical young lad and, like, was just... Every time I'd go out, he was with another girl and I was supposed to be his girlfriend and he couldn't, can't blame him. He's been playing fussy all his life and then gets this mega stardom and he was just filling his boots. <laughs> 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 Fucking superstar he became. Like, one of the greatest of all time. Like, absolutely phenomenal what he's done. And obviously yeah. his loyalty with Liverpool as well. Like I know how much the Scousers loved him. Um, did you know how good he was going to be? Did you have an inkling of of how good the talent was or was it just a case of just a young boy just footballer I think when I very first like started went going out with him everyone around me was just going oh he's the new big sign he's the new big thing and it was just Steven to me do you know what I mean I didn't I'd never followed football and he actually supported Everton so <laughs> <laughs> yeah but he just made me laugh um, and yes he's dead funny and like has done amazingly well like and 
probably one of the best footballers ever. Yeah, because his family are proper down here and all. They're not. They're not well. Respect a lot of people know them. His family, but so yeah. So, but how was that when you see his career? If you're with him, kind of dating, you're young. Mm -hmm. But then you end up in the relationship you're in, and you keep seeing him thriving. Do you ever think, fuck, what if? I never did. Now, I actually because he'd like broke my heart like a little bit at the time. I think that's what made me rebound into this relationship Bastard. and put more effort into like trying to make it work. Blame him, in it, dirty bastard, in it, cheating <laughs> bastard. <laughs> he was just doing his thing. Yeah, he's listening. He's a young boy, did because you were you not friends with Alex, his wife. Yeah, or was that a, just here? She used to go up with Tony. So he's reversed. She must be Robin. I hate hands. talking about things like this because we've all got families and lives. Yeah, of course. Um, but yeah, so. She was so I've, I'm probably a hero. Getting it away from him. <laughs> She's probably got a poster of you up in her wall. The girl who saved my life. Yeah. <laughs> no bulletproof windows in here tonight. <laughs> we can laugh about it, man, because it is fucked up. And laugh, it is fucked la up. Yeah, it? laughter's the key. But again, you young girl, you've got talent. You've got the world at your feet. How was it then try to come over that? How was it coming out and try to get your career back in? Because when did you do Hell's Kitchen? Was it 2004? Was that in the midst of the relationship? Um, In the midst with Tony? Yeah. 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 And you won that. Mm -hmm. um, how was Gordon Ramsay? Brilliant. Like, one of the best people I've ever met. Like... Just apps, just sounds in every way. Like, we... He just wants us to do well, but so passionate at what he did. And I'll never, ever forget, he used to run, because he's a proper, really good runner. He used to run to work. And um, the first day we got all the covers out, like, so we, everyone got fed, because we kept on, people were all complaining, because, like, about 20 people, 20 covers, 20 tables wouldn't get saved every night because we were so slow at first. First night we saved everyone. He ran home, got his kids out of bed, sat with us, had, he was having a glass of wine and all that. And was just... You could tell that he's just sounds, he's just a boss person. Scottish, aren't he? Yeah. They're all fucking sound bastards up there. Yeah. Is, uh, so you've won that. Why did you go on that? Because obviously you've got Hollywood, you're doing Chicago, you're doing a lot of big things because people usually go on those shows like your Hell's Kitchen was massive anyway, but he was just kind of starting his career. Yeah. Um, very first, one of the very first reality shows, to be honest. Yeah. But all his swearing and his antics kind of just catapulted him. Yeah. He couldn't do he that shit another, now. No, he never did another one after that. He just went straight to America. Who was all on that? So it was Matt Goss from Bross, um, me, Belinda Carlisle, um, Al Murray, James Dreyfus, um, who was in Gimme, Gimme, Gimme. Um, who else? Oh, the, uh, Abby Titmus. Uh, oh, it was a boss little cast. So like on my 20, I had my 21st birthday in there. I had um, Belinda Carlisle singing James Dreyfus playing the guitar and rapping, Al, um, Matt Goss singer. Like it was just like, mm -hmm. it was just boss. So, what happened great. after you won that again? You've got, you've, you've won a great show, you've won a big show. What happens then? Were you still kind of battling of not knowing what to do with your life? Yeah. I, after that, I went to LA and I got an agent over there and they wanted me to stay and do like pilot season and I just couldn't. Because of him? Yeah. Like, was he not letting you or did you feel as if you needed to be there with him? I needed to be there and also he just, yeah, he just wouldn't have moved with me and just wouldn't have let me do it really. Obviously hindsight's a wonderful thing. We can look mm. back and wish I'd have done things different but is that a big regret? But then if you never done everything, you wouldn't have your sons now, you wouldn't you have your man now. I don't now. have a single regret in my life, you know? Yeah. Like, and I think that's why I'm, ha like, I don't, like, where you said, do you ever look at it and go, that was it now? I'd like, because I wasn't happy then and what I've got now, like, I'm the happiest, like, person ever, like, and I re I don't think I'd, ever, I'd appreciate the man I've got, the husband I've got, if I wouldn't have been through all that shit. So what happens after it then? Did your, everything kind of take a, a standstill after the relationship? What happened? What did you do? Anything? Uh, well, I just stopped. Like, a year tour and everything wasn't an option because I was in a mess. 
Um, I just stopped auditioning. Um, and just doing little jobs. Um, and then I was it was kind of a mad time because you're talking when I was what in my early twenties. I was doing the yeah, a few things, but I think to be honest with you, yeah, the press had just want you kind of yeah damaged it a little bit to mm. be honest. But usually your directors and that don't really give a fuck either. No, I think it's like brands, like they didn't want to... What, take a chance? ...be associated with that kind of press. Anyone who's looking at me for like a show or anything, they go, oh God, no, she's got all that shit to deal with and him. And that's oh, understandable as well, because it's not a case of you've been had, had an argument or a disagreement. You know, it's, you're talking people's life at risk. It wouldn't have ever went that far. If you're in that life, you kind of know who's been targeted and why they're being targeted. But it's just for other people's well-being. It's, it's mm -hmm. a, it is a risk. You are a risk. Did you then stop going to auditions because you couldn't be asked with the, what the media would say? I just, I don't know. I think I was embarrassed, deep, deeply embarrassed. Um, I just didn't want to put myself out there to fail. If I can for the more rejection and the, the more knockback. So I just shut off completely. How do you learn how to trust again then? How do you then get married and have three sons? Is it three sons you have? Yeah. Three beautiful sons. So how do you then learn to trust? How do you overcome that and think, what if the next one becomes even worse? Because of who, who I've met, I think. Um, and I've, like... I don't know, I've just never, ever had a any doubts at all I don't know it's like I've just met the perfect person in my eyes like who just treats me like a princess is the best father I could possibly ask for the best husband I could possibly ask for like makes me feel like I'm the most gorgeous girl on the, on the planet so I don't ever doubt him how did you meet um, it was really weird, actually, because I did a, a show called A Little Help From My Friends. Um, and it was where ITV and they'd go to like a celebrity and then they'd get all the friends from school who'd turn up, random people from a past. And um, they'd do like a big community project. So I was filming that and like loads of my friends. God, that sounds terrible, yeah, but loads of my friends turned up and then we had a rap party. And I was with Tony and... Rob was with Claire and we just bumped into each other and he went, oh, hiya. Yeah. And I was like, hiya. Yeah. And then someone else popped in front and went, where's Claire? And then that was it. But it was <laughs> it was mad because Robert walked in and my mate Lee, he was gay, he was like, who the fuck's he? Because <laughs> he was boxing at the time. <laughs> and we were both like, oh, God, he's gorgeous, isn't he? So we were both <laughs> eyeing him up. Anyway, <laughs> we had this like instant meeting and then that was it, because obviously I went home to Tony, you went home to Claire. Um, and it was about a year later after it had all been in the papers with Tony, about six months after that, he just popped up on Facebook and added me. And I, we just started talking. And we were talking for about three months. Um, and then he was like, so he, he, he used to box, and he was like, do you fancy going to Ricky out and fight with me? And I was like... I don't even know you, my best mate's going to be, just go, just go. And I was like, no, because it was in Vegas. And I was like, no. And then he went, okay, then we'll kind of take it out for the date. And then that was it. The rest Seems of the day, bastards. Yeah. Like, the DMs on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking love that. <laughs> I, I think that. I got poked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a, a fucking nice fella, man. Big guy as well. Did you feel more protected that he was doing boxing and kind of, did you feel safe? Do you know what? He's like, he's not soft, but he's not a dickhead either. And I think mm. anyone who, who knows him knows he's just a sound fella. And he's like, he's he's not soft because he's like worked on the doors when he was a kid and, and his box all his life and he can have he can have a bash like. And so I feel protected in that way. Um But yeah, I just know he's a he's he's got a boss family, boss mum and dad. Like he's just a, that's what it's all about, isn't it? Yeah. 
Yeah, it must be difficult for men as well, though, to come into your life or come into anybody's life who's in the limelight. Because sometimes, as men, we do feel inadequate. We don't ever feel truly good enough, no matter how much confidence we have or what we drive or what we wear. We never truly feel. We always feel as if maybe somebody's better. Or it must be hard to come into somebody who had your status to then accept it as well without being fucking controlling nutcase. Like it must be difficult as well because all the attention you get and then uh, people stopping you. You know what I mean? So people made it all for him as well. I think because of what had happened previous, mm -hmm. like my best mate was like, my mum was a bit. Everyone was like hard work to him. <laughs> <laughs> Poor bastard getting interrogated. <laughs> it was the wrong guy they picked. It yeah. was the wrong guy you're interrogating. Like, was, even uh... my best mate, like on my birthday, you got like a chef brand and like done this. Got I mean, best mate, who's he fucking think he is? Getting having the chef here? Yeah? I'm like, I'm like, God <laughs> love him. He was only uh, like having yeah. a nice birthday for me. <laughs> Is there, how did he accept it? Was there any worries for the previous ex that there could have been rep repercussions because he was with you or was that already done? That was all done, yeah. Have you ever spoke to him prior? Yes. Yeah. Never ever seen him. Ever again? Never. Because he's still kicking about? I know he went he went to jail for eight years, I think. But it's good you came out other end. Did you did it take you a while to trust though? To to understand, okay, not every man's the same? Yeah. Like I'd, I was on my own for a while and I'd kind of just thought I'm I'm happy on my own. I don't, I don't want to be with a man again. And that's when you meet the person who you're meant to meet. I think when you're going out searching for it, I think, like I've seen some of my mates who like break up and they stay away their house. I'd just gone, do you know what? I'm done. I've had yeah. enough. <laughs> it's either that I've become lesbian or not. I've <laughs> had enough of men, yeah, yeah. Like literally, and I just kind of was happy to, to be on my own, um, and then that happened. When did you fall pregnant? Um, it was a bit of a a whirlwind, to be honest. Like, this is how you know it's right because I've been with someone for seven years, and the thought of having a child like sent shockwaves through my body, like ter terrified me, like because of the life it would live. Mm. Like, um, at that time, like I'm not saying that now, but like, um. But as soon as I met Rob, I just knew I wanted him to be. Yeah, he he's got twin girls. You see, Rob, and he's the best dad. And I just, you know, when you know someone's like, mm -hmm. so we got engaged after six months, and I was pregnant after six months. I think got married after a year. Yeah, so we've been married like sixteen years now. That's class. Yeah. Like I say, it's a. Uh, you can always judge a man, but how how he acts with his kids no matter if he's in a relationship or not it tells you a lot about a man it tells you a lot about a person as he's still in their lives because anybody can walk away but if you really want to get your kids you can still get them also women can be hard work when it comes to kids I went through it myself when people use a kid as a pawn but mm. as a father I've always pushed to make sure I still get them whether that's through courts or whatever it is um, yeah. but it's good when you can judge, really judge a character on how they treat other people, especially the relationship he has with his mum or his dad or his mm -hmm. kids. You can really get a good understanding that people who don't have any relationship with their mum, dads or other family members, you kind of question, maybe it's not everybody, maybe it's fucking you. Mm. So you had, the, what was it like having the son for the first time? Oh, it was amazing. What was that? Yeah. Were you in a good place then? Yeah, yeah. Um, really good place. I had a terrible labour though, like a really bad labour, like, six days um and i actually got told that i should never have, i would never have been able to give birth naturally um so i've been induced about four or five times and this, the baby still wasn't coming um so in the end they had to take his oxygen they were like his oxygen levels have dropped too low you've been in labor too long we need to get him out urgently so i had an emergency section but because I'd been induced and my pelvic bone was too too small for the baby's head to come out of, basically. So he was like wedged, so they couldn't get him out my stomach. Oh, how big was he? So nine pounds. So they literally had to put forceps into my stomach. And it was like, I think it was about, about 10 minutes. Of, it was like suction in the mouth. Fucking scooping him out like a bit of ice cream. Yeah. And he came out and he had this cone head two black eyes <laughs> um, I was like oh he's gorgeous and everyone around me was going Jesus tonight is he okay uh, so you end up having three yeah you seem like a right family person you seem like a good soul as well um, 
So was it just all about family life then? Did you think about, okay, I'm going to get back into things or were you just so caught up in being a, a better, best mother you could be? Just, I knew that I wanted to be present and I wanted to be there and I didn't want to be going off on tour. I didn't want to be going off to, to do anything else. So I was like, but how am I going to earn my money? And that's when I had Bobby. I was like, I can't leave. I want to be at his nativity. I want to be... I, you know, what is fussy games. I can't do what, I, what I've what i done all these years to earn money. So I thought, what else can I do? And that was when I set the school up. Yeah, your school's massive. Let's talk about the dance school. How Why is it so popular? Um, I don't know. I think the success of it, like the, the students have gone out and just multiple world champions in every single genre, um, working all over the world. We've got a college now, um, so we do BTEC, HNC, HND, and now a degree in performing arts. Um, so they just I instill what was instilled in me when I was young, and when I was younger, there was no mental health and mm -hmm. everything like that. And it was like, and I do really think that we've moved for the better, but I think sometimes the students can play on that as well. Like, I know students who just can't be asked to go to bed. Yeah. And they're like, I'm having a bad mental health day. So it's where you draw. Mm -hmm. You can't even say anything. You can't. Yeah. And it abuses it for the people who really are suffering as well, which mm -hmm. is what I don't like. Um, but I train them to the best I can. Like, all the funding from the government goes into the faculty like, people look at me and go, why are they having this many classes? They're only funded for half of this amount or a third of this amount. And I'm like, because I want them to be the best. I want them to go out and mm -hmm. to work and to tour and to... And they are. How many students you got? I've got about 200. Yeah, it's always seen your Instagram. It's always on the road. I think your van broke down a couple of weeks ago, did it not? God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Coming home from movie, yeah. Yeah. Is that your passion then? Do you think? Do you think that's your true purpose is to be surrounded by kids? And because you're a winner anyway, you've always been a winner. You've always won, no matter what it was. You've always succeeded, um, and it's good to see because then you can teach people. Because I don't know if you're born with a winning mentality. I, I think you could be ingrained in it as well, just by consistency. You can really learn. But I feel as if people are born with something special. I think you've so. just got it. You I can think? see it in my three sons, my eldest couldn't care less like mm. is happy to come last or my youngest is like <laughs> wants to win like sobs when he comes off from fussy and he hasn't won, like, <laughs> and that's yeah. like it's the same ingredients yeah. like it's me and Rob we've made them but they're mm -hmm. completely different and you can see that mentality and I don't think you can't teach that I mm -hmm. can't teach it as a teacher you can't create it it's got to be in you yeah I think you're, you're born with that kind of mentality of like I love that fact of, like, when you're a kid obviously crying when you lose because it makes you want to win Yeah, you know they just want to win and they'll do anything to win that's the best feeling ever because that's the ones who do succeed but mm. to be successful comes at a cost there is a lot of sacrifice a lot of sacrifice comes with success a lot of sacrifice comes with it like you'd have sacrificed a lot like you say your mum and dad would have sacrificed a lot to give you the opportunities do you feel as if you let them down as well even though you achieved everything when you were going through all that shit because you never really opened up to them. I just wish I never lied to them, but I was protecting them, I think. Yeah, people can understand that. Because if I would have told my mum, she'd have gone around and absolutely killed them. Yeah. And then, <laughs> you uh -huh. know, as you as a mum, like I know when Bobby comes home and says someone said this, your instinct is to, mm. to protect, isn't it? So I just was trying to protect them as much as I could. What was the idea to go on SES, Who Dares Wins? God knows. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think SAS done so much for me though because I'd given up on myself. Like I was a mum, like just literally all everything, everything was either for work, for the school, to provide for the boys, or just them. I didn't even look in the mirror before like I went. Like I'd just given up on myself, didn't buy myself new clothes, didn't spend money on myself. Went into SAS and I don't know, it just really kick-started something in me again. Yeah, yeah. Cause that's I, what you need. I thought I was going to be the first out, and, like, when I looked around the room, I was like, 
Dwayne Chambers, professional athlete, Ashley, like ex-professional football, like all 20s, all other Olympians, mm -hmm. Fatima Whitbread, who's the oldest, but she's a yeah, she's machine. fat. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm like looking around, I'm going, I, I am the first person, I was here, I am the weak link, I knew that. But I ended up doing really, really well. And like, when I got, like, I knew I'd really injured myself. I didn't realise to what extent I'd injured myself. But to keep going, it made me realise that I'm well stronger than I thought. Like, well stronger, because I, I, we all had these water bottles and like one day I'd messed up and I hadn't filled it up. So it made me pour it over my head in the middle of the night. So I was like obsessed then about filling this water bottle up. So we had to jump out the helicopter and I was first out. And as soon as I hit the water, I was like, <gasps> I thought, oh my God, I'm, I'm dead. Like that's the first thing I thought. Came up and I was like, oh my God, what have I done? Anyway, me and Jonathan got Jonathan um, swimming and he's not the strongest swimmer. So I was like, that I can't run, but I can swim. Like, so I was like, because my mum took me to all them swimming lessons, <laughs> getting me into Brugge. So I was swimming, got got on on the on the side and like got absolutely beasted. But the whole time I couldn't breathe, like literally couldn't breathe. Got home, was really, really ill. Went to the hospital and they were like, How have you continued? I had basically three broken ribs, my lung was full of blood, badly, badly infected, and I had a bleeding spleen. So they were gonna have to operate on me. And I was like, all for, for the TV show. I was like, mm. but they were just amazed that I kept going. Do you think you're hard on yourself and forget what you've actually achieved through life and how strong you actually are? Yeah. Yeah. Where does that come from? I don't know, you know. Just wanting to please and wanting to to do well and Probably sometimes thinking, have I like messed things up? Like, I don't know. But as long as you're a good mother, you're winning. Exactly. In my eyes, everything else comes second nature. It doesn't really mean fuck all. Like myself, I chase fame because I thought that would fill all the gaps that's really missing in my life. And uh, I'm not even at the level I'm going to go to, but I understand now. And I'm glad because when I was doing the podcast, it's always little small steps I've took. It's never been overnight success. So I don't really feel fuck all. No. But I interview enough people to realise, okay, I'm chasing the wrong things because I used to chase, listen, I love nice things. I still have nice watches, nice cars. I love it and I enjoy it. But I, sometimes in a minute I realise that it doesn't really, it doesn't fuel my, fuel my fire to then, this is that, I wake up every day excited. Do you know what I mean? There's always an element of always something missing and, and the more I speak to people, the more I realise it's male and female who do we all struggle because we're living in a very fast-paced world. We just want to do right, and we sometimes feel confused by it. But like I say, all the stuff that you've done is amazing. You've, as long as you're a good mother, your kids are healthy. That's what I'm saying. There's people out there who are just do their thing to be a good mother. They, for me, are the most successful people on the planet. That's like my everything now. It's just being the best mum that I can be for the boys, giving the best. I possibly can for them. How was it fighting Pete Wicks? I got chinned. <laughs> <laughs> See, if you put it on him, you'd have battled him, though. <laughs> You're stronger than him. I'm blind and everything. He's proper Andy Pete, you know, like, I don't know, I just, <laughs> I've never had, like, I don't know, it was just like. He was crying, wasn't he? Yeah. And then he knocked himself out and went and nearly killed himself. God, he's a proper Sam fella. Yeah, I like I, Pete. I like everybody that was on that show because Ashley Kane, who I know well, no. loved to bits what he's been through. He's a fucking animal, how he's fueled that, that pain and yeah. used it all against him to push on because you don't know what he's battling every day, that kid. Like, he's just an animal. He's just fucking unbelievable. And it gives people inspiration because a lot of people go the other side he's used that as a positive yeah massively and uh, it makes you question well my life ain't that bad do you yeah. know what I'm saying so who else big Callum yeah yeah <laughs> it he's was a, a proper boss little group yeah, you know yeah yeah he was crying Pete wasn't he <laughs> <laughs> because Rudy Rhea, Rudy Rudy I know they're one yeah. of the instructors yeah um, they're animals, these guys. Oh. They're fucking animals. It's mad where the human mind can take you. The respect that I had, like, when I left, like, 
the things that like even like just before I had my arm band taken off, we were walking up this mountain and Foxy was like, Fucking stop me crying and he was like, I was I had to put we had to, like each other on our backs walking up this mountain in the heat and he went, I fucking did this in Afghanistan. He went, I was getting fucking shot at by them. We were all like, I thought, God, I think that you have got a bad here yeah, walking up this hill and he was getting shot at. Like, so were you. Like, <laughs> 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 I'm saying, you've got a lot of housing fire. No one, do you love that show? You had fucking so much to connect with everybody. <laughs> oh <laughs> I'm saying, you've got turn around and says, who's not? You fucking pussy. <laughs> is, uh, how, how is that show off camera though? Is it Obviously it's still strict. Is it no. real bullshit or is it fake? This is the most real thing you will ever, ever like. Doesn't stop. But... Because it's only like 45 minutes an episode, they don't show, like, you don't sleep. They have you on an hour call, so every hour, Callum Best like that with a red light at you going, come on, Jen, your turn. And you're like, oh, get out your sleeping bag. You have to put all your wet clothes on, get out. Everything is 100% real. Like, real. Like, they don't stop at all or let up on you. And why has that gave you the kick up the ass to really get back in the zone again? Why that show? It took me to places mentally that... Do you know you were strong enough? Yeah, like... I'm scared of heights and, like, made me realise that your body can, like, go to places that you just... Because I just always quit on myself, always. But because I didn't want to be the weakest link, I, like, and I was like, fucking hell, you can still do this. You, like, And it gave me respect for myself after it. That made me think, right, come on, you're going to sort yourself out. Do you think that's the first time and since everything you've been through you've really you've believed in yourself again? Yeah, and it's the first time I ever spoke about it in there and I don't know why because I wasn't going in there to speak about it mm -hmm. but literally just went Bleh! that's when you heal mm -hmm. you've bottled all that up for years the more you speak about it the more you laugh about it mm -hmm. because you think what the fuck was I thinking but there's so many people that can relate because once you speak about it it doesn't have the power you f f from you anymore no even though we think we're in control we've got kids we're married we've moved on still there and you'll still think about it next mm -hmm. editions that come it will always pop up but you can't that's your story you're not the only fucking mad bastard who's got a mad story to, to back it up. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You've got to use it as fire. So when you hear everybody else speaking, you think, well, wait a minute. Because the thing about the Glaswegians and Liverpool, <clears throat> we was saying that Liverpool, they fucking love to do podcasts, man. There's not many Glaswegians, but we always feel wary of speaking as if you're speaking out of school still, as if you're maybe mm. still in that life. But all we're trying to do is educate people. Don't make the same mistakes. Don't fucking do that. There's telltale signs. There's red flags here. Speak to your mum and dad or speak to your best friend. Get some information of how other people would react and see the story. So sometimes we can suffocate alone instead of, I need to speak to somebody here. And then when you mm -hmm. speak about it, then you see people relating to it. And like I say, these longer formats, people can relate and then the love you get and then you go, wait a minute, life is okay. Yeah. And the confidence grows again. Then you're back to the person you were at fucking 16, 17, 18. Then the opportunities rise. Then you're going to additions and you're getting with confidence. Yes, it was my story. It was fucked up. But you laugh about it and then you write a book and then you fucking put up possibly get a docu-series or certain things that happen. That Because the only person who fails is you, me. Mm -hmm. People say, oh, do you not worry about getting cancelled the shit that you do? If I was to get all my platforms took away, my life would be better. Because it's fucking damaging. I'll figure out something again how to be successful. Mm -hmm. Nothing else. The people who cancel, the only person who gets cancelled is themselves. No matter what anybody says, no matter what people do, no matter your backstory. I interview about uh, murderers and people come in their pants and go, oh, it was amazing. They love these guys. These people have killed people. Yeah. But people give them fucking second, third, fourth, fifth chances because they respect the honesty. So when you're broken and admit you're broken and then speak about it, people can relate to it because everybody, I believe, has got a little bit of brokenness in them. Mm -hmm. But when they see strength from it, and that's when you then get the confidence to realise, I can speak about all this stuff. It literally did. I think that's what gave me this lease of life because it was almost like this shame of talking about it and I felt like everyone had disowned me if I spoke about it. And it was like a, like a dirty secret, like, and I yeah. could never, ever speak about it. But... I don't even know, like, and I, I tortured myself when I was in there. I was thinking, why have I spoke about that? And I just, but it, it's been the best thing. Yeah. Did you feel and like it's not it was... a secret? And it's it's my life, and yeah. it happens, and it's how I've you know got to where I am now. It's my story. Yeah, it's nearly twenty years ago, but people mm -hmm. obviously are still intrigued by it. But the more you talk, talk about it, people go, yeah, it's kind of done now. Yeah. You know what I mean? But when you're living with that shame, <clears throat> because I've had comedians on. 
who've apologised for jokes and it's ruined them. Mm -hmm. But the fuck you're apologising for? You're a comedian. Own it. People say mad shit all the time. I feel as if when you shy away from it, people see weakness. Yeah. They fucking jump on it and it just breaks them down, breaks them down. But once you've got that power back, all the shackles come off and then nobody can touch me. Say what you want, write what you want. Who fucking mm -hmm. cares? I've got a story. But the thing about the media's not just get four channels anymore but you need them to be successful people can set up a tiktok today and be fucking successful next week yeah by doing daft shit so there's so many opportunities to do what you want in life make make what you want do what you want as long as you're not harming anybody be you mm -hmm. but do you feel now you're ready to go again do you feel as if it's time your kids are getting older everything's happy you've got a man who supports you do you feel as if okay i'm going to give this another crack because yeah. you'll probably be better now than you were because now you've got that extra experience in your locker and appreciate it more yeah yeah definitely yeah i do feel like this is the time now that i would like to start going back into it yeah what about the east end doesn't that or do you want to go movies with you want to do I'd love, to, I'd love to do a drama, like a proper gritty drama. And so, like, what Claire Sweeney's doing, Cardi and stuff like that, I'd love to do something like that. Yeah, she seems yeah. nice, Claire. Oh, she's sound. She boss. Have you had any opportunities since SES? Um, I did a, a, a small tour to take that musical, which I loved. Absolutely loved it. And it was great. The kids came to see it. The kids were like, oh my God, Mum, never seen you do anything. So seeing them react to it made me think, do you know what? I, I could, could get back into it and do it. Do your passion because you can see your eyes light up when you speak mm. about it. As there was much talk as... about me going back into Chicago, um, but I don't think it's going to happen. Why? You never know, yeah. man. you just got to go for it. Do you yeah. feel as if you've, because like I say, you've got the experience now, mm. you'll fucking handle it at a breeze. Everything will be, come easier because you've already overcome all that madness. Yeah. All that pain and misery makes us who we are today. That's the beautiful thing about it. But the sad thing is as well, we still do think about it. I think about my friends and my dad and I wish he was here because he would love to be meeting all the people that I'm doing. So even when I'm driving home, it kind of gets lonely. Mm. You think, ah, bastard. But then I think, listen, stop feeling sorry for yourself. We're very good at feeling sorry for ourselves, humans. Mm -hmm. Very good at it. But life is a beautiful journey, man. It really is. If you really can understand the patterns and you don't need to accept the life that you're in, you can be better you can have better it's a beautiful thing if you can realize that the sad thing is not other people will realize their true potential no. you could have been in that relationship still now and the damage you could have done a couple of kids you feel as if because you're you kind of person who probably would have been there for the kids mm -hmm. so we've got to count our blessings as well god yeah mm -hmm. so tell me plans for the future um i don't want any more kids is that you done <laughs> yeah i'm done for done um my eldest has got a GCSEs in the next two years so we've got to get that out of the way but I would I think this would be like now I've changed from one casting bracket to now I'm getting put off like the mum roles and stuff like that so I think it could be like a new little kind of I don't know like going back into like that acting side and the old kind of career that I had yeah. what's your dream role just a real gritty Liverpool drama. That could be fucking plenty of them. Mm -hmm. Why don't you, like you say, have you ever wrote a script? No. <clears throat> you could sit down with someone, man, and put mm -hmm. something together. You could put a real life drama of your own story. Mm hmm. Everybody loves it. My biggest hitters is true crime. Doesn't matter what people yeah. say about the guests. It doesn't matter. They'll still watch. The biggest things on Netflix is true crime. People love negativity. People yeah. love gangsters. People love shootings. People love cocaine. People love fucking madness. Because everybody, every man thinks they're a gangster. Mm -hmm. now, I've interviewed some fucking divvies as well. Like, But I would never embarrass them. But oh. in their mind, they feel as if they're a proper... I know. Do you know what I mean? I know a lot of people who can give me the information, what I need to know before something, and I go, okay, but I've never embarrassed them. Because the thing about the people in the UK, we ain't daft. There's not much goes by us. We're very in tune with who's full of shit and who's not, who's real and who's not. So the thing about the UK public, if you're going to be talking shit, then it's down to you. But people just love those stories still. Yeah. They fucking love them. So you've definitely got something there to then work on it. Find that fire and go, do you know what? This is a fucking beautiful part of my life. Your kids are healthy, you're raised, you've got a stable household, which is which is important for anybody, especially a man. Men don't want drama. We want peace. We want to come home that's peaceful and 
And if you've got peace at home, the man would do anything for his missus. So they would, mm -hmm. uh, from my own opinion, that's the way it should be. Men are providers and protectors. I'm old school. I think there's a lot of confusion now with like, masculine energy and feminine energy. But a woman's true source is when she becomes a mum. That's yeah. her true purpose because nothing else should matter. That's when she truly knows this is what it's about. Because no matter what TV show you're in or movie you're in, it doesn't it's irrelevant to what... It means nothing. Yeah, it means fuck all. You know what I'm saying? So who's the best person you've worked with? Probably Gordon Ramsay. Mm. He's a mad bastard. But if, what he's achieved from a chef I know. is unbelievable. I was absolutely devastated because his football career was like lost. Like he, he wants to be a footballer. Yeah, Rangers he yeah. played with in that back in the day. I think he had like a, was it a spleen injury or yeah. something. And then, yeah. So he's been the best you've worked with? Like the most genuine and down to earth. And like I never forget it. We went, I went on holiday to Dubai and... The, the, the hotel concierge came and he went, we've got a booking for you for tonight. And I was like, a friend has booked it. And I was like, he went, there's a car waiting for you at, at six o'clock. So I went down to White Rolls Royce, go to this Hilton in Dubai, sitting there. And then the next thing, all right, just fucking runs out, picks me up. It's all like proper really posh, <laughs> swings me around. And I was like, oh my God. And literally like, and, it, and Gordon had done it all, like, just invited me to his home, met the kids, met Tanya, like, literally just gorgeous human. That's mad, isn't it? Yeah. I love people who don't change off camera, on camera, they're still the same. Mm. That's the people you go, okay, man, you've got something about you. People change, you'd have seen it, get through that life. What's the hardest thing about being in the limelight? The fakers, the, the hangers on. Like, there's people who... I think you're surrounded. I think this is why people get fucked up when they go into this industry because there's so many yes people who are being paid to do a job and no one will actually tell you straight. Like, so when they're staying up and they're doing this and they're doing that, there's no one who's actually to go sort your shit out. And I think that's because they're getting paid, so they don't want to upset you. And I've seen so many people surrounded by fake phonies and it just... It can be lonely. What's the biggest life lesson you've learnt? That, like, you can look at someone and think that because they've got material things, they're, like, they're flying high and they're happy. Like, and it means absolutely nothing. There's nothing that you can buy now that you'll give a shit about in 10 years or, like, you, your happiness and... It's just invaluable. Like when I was driving me Bentley and dripping in diamonds and everything, I was fucking miserable. Miserable. Like, honestly, like you look at someone and people, people, they look at successes, what house you've got, what car you drive. <sighs> That's not success. Yeah, success for me is happiness and how happy you are. You can have all yeah. the money in the world and yeah. not be happy. Because people say, oh, I'd rather greet in a bent, I'd rather cry in a Bentley than I would like a Fiesta or whatever. But the real flex is not crying. Mm. That's the real flex. Because I know people, that's, and I've been saying it lately, but people who's got a camper van, drive around themselves, seeing nature, just living day by day to fill up their petrol, maybe have a loaf of bread. They're happier than the billionaires that I've interviewed. A hundred percent. And people can't, and I wish people, Jim Carrey says that he wish people could taste Everybody could taste fortune and fame to realise that's not it. Mm -hmm. But when you're looking, if you are struggling and some people are not doing anything with their life, all they do is moan and complain, they'll see other people moaning, oh, but it's okay for you to say you've got money. And possibly they're right, but you can be happy anywhere you are. Mm -hmm. Happiness is a mindset and it's how you can tap into that mindset to see the great things in life. But we don't because we're kind of greedy as well. Like I talk about all this shit, but it's like a mental contradiction. I moan about this and that, but yeah, I'm still fucking wearing a Rolex, I'm still driving a Range Rover, I'm still doing all that shit, but I just know that it's not where my true potential is or my true kind of purpose is, but I still fucking like it, I would, I would rather have that than yeah. the shitty Rover that I first had, my first car, <laughs> but I, I was happier when I had that, Yeah, I remember getting it with my mum, there's like three grand, I was fucking buzzing. I had all my CDs. I had like a little, little CD case. I had all my fucking like, eh, my rap albums. Then I had like the chart albums and 
I was just buzzing. I used to put it in, put my, my music on and drive around for fucking hours and hours and I was so happy. Yeah. And now I've got a fucking nice big car. I've got fucking few cars, but I think I'm not as happy as I was when I tasted the first. And that's the way yeah. it is, but that's fucking life. So how are you feeling today? You feel good? Yeah. Really yeah. Good. Were you nervous or anything? I was really nervous. As I say, it's like... I've never done a podcast and then it's talking about things that mm -hmm. aren't nice to talk about. So. Yeah, but it grows strength. Mm -hmm. And now you're going to have, your inbox will be flooded because people have gone through the same shit you've gone through. Maybe not is it that extent, but it's that emotional control. A lot of women go through it. A lot of men go through it. Women are bastards as well. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? You kind of get things twisted. Like, it works both ways, but you become the strength for other people to overcome it, to kick on, because it can ruin people. Suicide, addiction, everything else creeps in when you're, when you're in a low vibration and when you're going through dark stuff. Nobody really knows how to handle it because mm -hmm. we all get too much pride. Don't want to ask anybody for help. Sometimes people want to try and get help when it's too late, you know? Yeah. What about the singing? So yeah, what was your album, your first song? Did not go top ten or number yeah, five, number I had two six? Top ten yeah, singles, yeah, yeah, yeah. How was it? And do you know what? It was because that um, it, if I'd have released the week after, it was that effervescence, bring me back to life. Uh -huh. Number one. If I'd have released it the week after, I'd have gone to number one. Bastard. How was it when you done? Because obviously, when you listen to music from the nineties now or early two thousands, to it's totally different. Yeah. You've got that cheesy pop like Westlife and. All the other kind Tom of boys, and, uh, and yeah, yeah Atomic well. Kit and Girls yeah. Allowed. You kind of had that with the dresses, the fake tan. Mm. But do you look at your own music and think, fucking cringy bastard? <laughs> 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 because I'll probably watch interviews and I watch that. When I hear my own voice, I think, man, you talk some shite. But I know I'll probably have more knowledge in 10 years and I'll think, the shite you were talking. But it feels good now. I feel <laughs> yeah. as if I'm, I'm on it. I know what I'm doing, but is it the same for yourself? Yeah, you... like if the kids in the school or anyone will, will put it on, I go, turn it off, turn it yeah. off. Oh, I literally can't listen to it. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, it was, um, again, living a dream. Yeah. yeah. For anybody watching that's maybe struggling in life, you've come through your struggles yourself, what advice would you have for them? Don't give up on yourself. Um, and that just, because there's, I've just, just keep going because there's times when, as I say, the easiest thing for me would have been to just call it a day. Um, but I've kept going and almost I'm the happiest I've been now and got what, and I'd have never have envisioned this at the time. Like you just you just ploughed under with negativity and darkness and there's no light at the ends of the tunnel. You just keep cracking on, honestly, and things will get better, it will lift. Um because I'd have never have thought it was up for me. You used to be addicted to sunbeds. I wasn't addicted. Yeah, I watched a video and it was like young loose women. You said you were getting like tan injections and your sunbeds all the time. I was like, that, 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 it's always, I still all, fucking use them. I still time. use them from time to time. Not <laughs> as much as I used to. Yeah. But if I'm feeling like shit and I look in the mirror and I think, you look fucking grey. A girl go and I'll get her 12 minutes, but I'll go fucking, I'll go pure dark. Yeah, I used to go on for like, we used to go on for 16 minutes. Yeah, I was 15, I think. We used to get 15, but then the next, if it was the weekend, Thursday, Friday, 15, 15. Yeah. And I had the big white patch at the top of my ass, I think all the sweat goes <laughs> down. <laughs> People say you use sunbeds. I think I don't use. I used to deny it back then yeah. because it wasn't a manly thing. God, what were we so it like? was fucking sunbeds, man. Yeah, I watched a video and it says you were addicted to sunbeds. I don't know if they fucking just put that title Maybe. there. I've never had a tan injection in my life, like. Yeah, no, fuck that. That's, that's, <laughs> that's too much, man. No. But you're feeling good today. Mm -hmm. You're looking good, man. You've got a great vibe about you. Thank I can't you. fucking wait to see what you do for the future. I believe this. Listen, you don't need the, the extra springboard to then leap you in, but you seem ready. You seem as if it's a good time for your life right now. It is. Yeah. Good on you, babe. Would you like to finish up on anything else? Just to say thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you. It's been, honestly, it's been lovely talking to you, saying things out the air and... Thank you for the opportunity. Anytime I wish you and your family nothing but the best. And you. God bless you. Thank you.